Prevention Roundtable. Welcome to the webinar and thanks for joining this Green Chemistry webinar as part of our Safer Chemistry Challenge program webinar series. My name is Cindy McComas and I'm serving as adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota and I'm also working as a project manager on the Safer Chemistry Challenge program with the National Pollution Prevention Roundtable. With this webinar, we're wrapping up the spring series, and this webinar is entitled Online Resources for Safer Chemicals. I'm sure you'll find some great resources here today. Uh, it'll provide you with information that will help you advance your efforts towards safer chemistries using source reduction strategies as part of your sustainable business program. The spring webinar series has helped to advance the goal of the Safer Chemistry Challenge program, and that goal is to motivate, challenge, assist, and reward companies as you work toward finding safer alternatives to chemicals of concern to human health and the environment. The Challenge program is a unique partnership between industry, states, and nonprofits. It can accelerate opportunities for you to capture emerging markets for products with safer chemistries, and it results in a cleaner environment while providing value to your company's bottom line. So even though we're with this webinar, we're wrapping up the spring series. We have a number of events coming up that we want you to know about. Uh, we have uh, July 1st is the deadline for the National Pollution Prevention Roundtable Most Valuable P2 Awards. Those applications are due again July 1st, 2012. And we hope that you'll take some time to look at the website, which is p2.org and uh, take a look at the application. It's quite easy to fill out and to recognize uh, either for your program or for someone else that you feel is, is uh, due some recognition for their uh, green chemistry or pollution prevention efforts. Also, Pollution Prevention Week is coming up September 17th through 21st. And the fall webinar series will kick off that week with a webinar that we're currently planning with Staples. Uh, Roger McFadden, and then it will go through December of 2012, so it will be a four-month series in the fall. Then we have our Green Chemistry Conference November 13th through 14th in Chicago at the Hyatt downtown, and we have a green screen training immediately following on November 15th in Chicago. So we hope that you can uh, take in one of those uh, events coming up. So just a few logistics to cover before we start. During the webinar, all attendees will be on mute. If you have questions, please submit them through the Submit Question option in the toolbar that GoToWebinar provides. And if there's time, questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. We'd very much like to hear from you about how the webinar meets your company's program needs to move towards safer chemistry. So at the end of the webinar, you'll receive a survey, and please be sure to provide us with your feedback. It's time to introduce our webinar for today, which is entitled Online Resources for Safer Chemicals. Uh, the webinar will walk attendees through two uh, sources of useful resources, the P2RX Safer Chemical Alternatives Topic Hub and the Alternatives Assessment Tools used by the Toxic Use Reduction Institute at the University of Massachusetts Lowell um, with an emphasis on a, an illustration by uh, substituting for dry cleaning chemicals. The two speakers for today's webinar are Michelle Gaither and Pam Eliasson. Michelle has a, so I'll give you a few bios here. Michelle Gaither has a, a bachelor's in industrial engineering from the University of Washington and a master's in environmental science from Washington State. Uh, in addition to over 15 years of environmental experience providing technical assistance and support to government agencies, small businesses, and a national lab. Her focus areas have been uh, pollutant identification and prevention, toxics reduction, lean and green, and recycling. She's been with the Pacific Northwest Pollution Prevention Resource Center, or PPRC, for 12 years and is currently working with the Washington State Department of Ecology and other PPR staff to pilot chemical alternatives assessment methods for various chemicals and products, and you'll hear more about that today. Pam is the Senior Associate Director and Industry Research Program Manager at, the, at TURI, or the Toxics Use Reduction Institute at UMass Lowell. Since 2000, she's managed several programs, including the Academic Research Program, which provides funding for UMass researchers to conduct pertinent research that could lead to the reduction in the use of toxic chemicals by Massachusetts industries. Pam was a lead researcher and author of 
a very well-known study, the Institute's Five Chemicals Alternatives Assessment Report, which was commissioned by the Massachusetts legislature to evaluate the availability of technically and economically feasible safer alternatives to those five specified chemicals. PAM focuses on assessing and promoting the adoption of safer alternatives to toxic chemicals use in Massachusetts and around the world and for disseminating information on examples of successful implementation of cleaner technologies in industry. So we'll begin the webinar with Michelle and then Pam will follow. Thank you. Can you hear me? Sure. Yes, great. Okay. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Thanks for everyone for attending today. So I will not repeat our, the name of my organization since Cindy already kindly did that and it's a long name, but I would PPRC for short is what we'll use for henceforth. So we're one of seven pollution prevention resource exchange or P2RX centers, uh, nonprofits across the country and each serves different EPA region. Just kind of a little graphic there to show that. Next slide, please. And uh, we, the P2RX centers collectively have over 70 what we call topic hubs, and I don't know exactly where that name come, came from, but the, the, it's a hub of information, kind of a primer uh, of, intended to talk about pollution prevention and op opportunities in pollution prevention for various industries or on, around various topics. So it's content sharing, and if you can go, you can go to the P2RX site or you can go to any one of the center sites and you'll see this whole list of uh, 70 topic hubs and, and you can Click on them and become instant experts. <laughs> so our hub table of content, go ahead. For the safer chemical alternatives, um, we talk about, uh, we have a background and overview, reasons for action, identifying chemical hazards and labeling systems, uh, related efforts, tools, and resources, then some, go through some case studies and examples, and finally, uh, kind of the resource areas of where to go for help and complete list of links. Next slide, please. Um, it seems like, I'm sorry, it seems like some of these, my slides are missing or, or you're skipping some. Hmm. This, this is Angela. They're actually put on here as a race, so they won't. They're not showing up. That's why. Oh, I'm very sorry. I don't know how that happened. So, uh, can what to do? What do you? What do we need to do? Uh, give me a second. Well, I can talk about this slide as we're. As I'll just run it. I'll just run it through this way. Okay. This is the, I'm going to be able to do it quickly. Okay, and can you go back uh, just two slides, one more? Okay, so just real quick, why, why uh, this one, yes, why, we, why PPRC has decided to write this safer chemical alternatives topic hub is we've been delving a bit into green chemistry and chemical alternatives analysis for some time. Currently, we're, we're comparing two different methodologies with Washington State Department of Ecology and they want to compare the outcomes of these two methodologies for traffic paint and propyl bromide, which is uh, something Pam will talk a little bit more about as well. But it's a degreaser and a um, and then a, a sometimes a replacement for perk and dry cleaning, and also TCE and, and uh, Acrostrip, which is a uh, greener solvent. And uh, Brian Pentola, our chemical engineer, has supported clean production actions, green screen training. He might be in the, at the Chicago training and revisions of the green screen. And then we've also been involved in Washington State's green chemistry roadmap. And just in general, our mission is uh, always to keep an eye, nose, and ear out for uh, looking for opportunities to minimize toxics for uh, either helping agencies do that or, or helping companies, manufacturers directly do that. OK, so now slide six, please. So the topic hub itself and the scope and overview, uh, mostly talking about the, the red areas or the red 
context areas. Uh, but but chemical alternatives is a, a much wider uh, purview, has a much wider purview. And um, so specifically, I try to talk about the hazards of existing chemicals and, um, and identifying alternatives, evaluating, evaluating the hazards of those alternatives that, you, that a company finds might, might be of interest, and then looking for ways to eliminate or minimize use as, as another alternative. Um, you, can see, you can eliminate, eliminate or minimize use. That's one alternative. Or uh, finding a different, uh, better, safer alternative is another way to think about it. So, and I just wanted to put a plug in for the alternatives assessment guidance document that the Department of Ecology and six other states, I believe, are involved in. And I've I've got the uh, link here. It's a, it, it it addresses kind of a continuum of of these bullets plus several others, and, and you and you can pick and choose which aspects of it you would like to use in, a, in an alternative assessment exercise. Um, then the topic hub is really not addressing risk assessment or life cycle assessment, but these are, in the whole scheme of things, are, um, are, are very important parts of, of the whole hazard assessment. Okay. Angela, sorry, my screen is is going crazy. Okay, assessment relationships. So I, I briefly mentioned the risk assessment it includes the hazard evaluation, which was normal part of an alternative assessment, plus the exposure assessment, and a life cycle assessment gets can get can be very small or very large. Um, I apologize. I can't follow. Is, is, is everybody's screen flipping around, or is it just mine? Uh, there, it's everyone's is. I'm pretty sure. Okay. All right. So, so the life cycle assessment can involve um, in every everything from, as you all probably know, beginning of life to end of life, extraction of materials, toxic greenhouse gas emissions, embodied energy, and end of life. Type thing. So, um, so this, and I did not generate this chart, but I thought it was a good visual of how these how these tools overlap. Next slide, please. So, hazard assessments kind of pioneered uh, by the EPA's Design for Environment program, which they identified 16 hazard endpoints as the most important ones, and will. You will see some types of those in a, in a minute here. Uh, they established ranking criteria to identify the high, moderate, or low level of concern for each of those 16 endpoints. And then the outcome of this is to provide data really to form informed decision making uh, based on the data that they find and the ranking of the data, high, medium, or low. But it doesn't benchmark and give you a final outcome in that sense. And I'll show that in a minute as well. Um, so EPA's methodology has been adapted by others, and just a few of them are clean production actions, green screen, and their quick screen tools. And then the Depart Washington State Department of Ecology's quick chemical assessment tool, which is actually available online now on their website. Okay, next slide, please. So the EPA's uh, criteria Ranking criteria should be coming up here shortly. Slide nine. Michelle, I'm going to switch slides real quick. I fixed the other ones. OK. So they'll show, because folks are not able to see these. Is that the one, Michelle? Yes, thank you. So the hazard alternative, alternatives assessment criteria for DP or for each DFE program I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but just as you can see, the endpoints go down on the, the blue column, and you're look at, looking at various uh, various hazard endpoints and environmental health impacts as well. And um, so, for instance, if I had a dermal LD50 of 150 for the specific chemical, uh, the data that I find, um, 150 milligrams per kilogram, I'm going to rank that as a very high concern. 
And you can see the color is very high, high, moderate, and low. So you can kind of get a visual picture of green is good, red is bad. Next slide, please. And this is a kind of a generic matrix, but many of these tools end up using a matrix. Uh, and so this is cleaning solvent ABC, and the, you see the constituents of the cleaning solvent. And then you see the human health effects endpoints, the environmental health endpoints, and the environmental state endpoints, and then physical hazards. And uh, so then the data that you use, you rank these based on whatever criteria the tool calls for. And um, lo and behold, you have a good visual then of, this, of the concerns with this particular solvent. So you can use this matrix for one chemical that has multiple, or one item that has multiple chemicals, or you could put chemical one uh, on one of the rows and chemical two on one of the rows, and then you wind up looking at two different chemicals and comparing them uh, side to side. And then the DG stands for data gap, which uh, we are tending to run into quite a few as we start looking for the data. Next slide, please. And then benchmarking, some of these, the final outcome of these hazardous systems is usually some kind of a benchmarking type thing where, and, and this is the clean production actions green screen benchmark. One is avoid, two is use, but search for better. For benchmark three is there's still opportunity for improvement, and benchmark four is this is a preferred chemical or preferred product. And then I'm just, I, I won't really talk about this other one, but another way to think of it, of buckets and using your colors to, to tag um, high, low, and high, medium, and low concern is, is this graph presented by the DFP program. OK, next slide, please. So final, the final answer. The hazard assessment yields one of the considerations needed for decision makers, but it, it doesn't provide any information really on technical feasibility, economic feasibility, uh, you know, what, how is it going to perform in the field and that sort of thing. And judgment does come into play with most of these methods, and not all methods will yield exact same results, and there are always uh, usually data gaps for, uh, for many of the chemicals that are out there. And in particular, one of the data gaps that we are finding with all of our chemicals is endocrine disruption data, unless, because there's a, a fairly small amount of chemicals that have been assessed for that. Next slide, please. OK, so moving on to the rest of our hub content. There's our, we have a reasons for action section. And um, this kind of discusses safer workplace, safer products and commerce, regulatory compliance, cost savings. That happens in many cases, although some, some companies will end up picking a safer alternative, even though it does cost them more. Uh, reduced environmental impacts, empowering of employees and citizens to buy safer materials, and then hopefully increased market share, especially with considering reach and other um, increasing uh, market pressures for safer products. Next slide, please. So our next section is identifying chemical hazards and labeling systems. And this is just one practical strategy type section. We're hoping to get more, so I'm open to ideas if you guys, if anybody has suggestions for additional sections. But this one, uh, go ahead and switch. Uh, next slide, please. This one was written by Brian Pentla, and he um, he talks about the different labeling systems and how you can use these to help under, better understand what's in your products. So these are just three examples, the HMIS, the NFPA, and the Lab Safety Supply Companies, HMIG. Next slide, please. And I'm not going into any detail here, but this is the, the, on the left is the label, and on the right is a legend. So it, it tells you the, the hazard for one, two, three, and four. The star represents um, two as a moderate hazard, but it also has a chronic effect, not just an acute effect. And then the legend is very helpful in, in, in the personal protection um, identification and need. Next slide, please. And this is the globally harmonized system, which is 
um, an international system of classification and labeling using pictograms. And I know that OSHA is, is planning on adopting this in, um, I, I think they're already actually starting to implement it. And so this may uh, supersede some of the other previous labeling programs I've, I've shown you. Next slide, please. So hopefully that section describes a lot of uh, the issues around labeling and how to use that to, to be more uh, astute on your chemicals. So the next quest or next section is related efforts, tools, and resources where we discuss policy, green chemistry and design, pollution prevention, market influences, a, a number of the different tools and frameworks, just briefly touching upon them and, and, and telling you where to look for more information. A uh, discussion of ingredient disclosure, which is becoming more prevalent and demanded by more consumers and customers, companies. Uh, the standardized classifications and labeling systems, and then where to go find this toxicity and environmental state and environmental data to be able to rank your chemicals. And then a little short discussion on prohibited or restricted substance lists that a lot of companies are are requiring that their suppliers do not provide any materials or products to them that contain substances they don't want in their products. And just real quick, the substitution back up to the pollution prevention idea, there's um, there's other good tools out there, substitution, substitution databases such as Cleaner Solutions where you can see if there's a uh, an already proven solvent that will work for a given application. Um, and then uh, I talk about the e-receipts because I, I've listened to Cal Bear Anderson's um, bisphenol A and thermal paper receipts um, talk about, um, okay, here's an example of elimination. When you, instead of ha print, having a printing, printed receipt at your bank or your ATM or and various uh, retailers are starting to do this too, you can just get an e-receipt uh, mailed to you. So you're completely eliminating bisphenol A or bisphenol S in um, in products that you're handling and the stores are handling and printing out. Next slide, please. So uh, just a couple additional example methodologies, uh, Toxic Use Reduction Institute, P2 Oasis, hope I said that correctly, and Pam may briefly mention that and, and the intent behind that tool. There's a chemical assessment and ranking system from zero waste. There's a, the Tracy system, which uses a matrix so, somewhat similar to the one I, I showed you, uh, but has a lot more endpoints on it. And then uh, Dr. Stephen Gilbert, and here he's a Seattleite, uh, University of Washington uh, a toxicologist, and he's developed some precautionary principle assessment criteria, which is maybe a little less data intensive and uh, gives you a little more quantitative way to risk rank chemicals. Kind of interesting. So let me know if you want a copy of that. I can send it to you. And next slide, please. So uh, in, in our topic hub, we also uh, provide a number of the different data sources that you can uh, go to to find either human health impact data, um, environmental fate data, environmental persistence, uh, environmental health impact, such as aquatic toxicity. And some of these databases actually will uh, cover all of the endpoints for you if you're, if you're lucky. All right, next slide, please. And this is the IC2, the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse Database. This is an eight-state effort to put together, uh, or the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse is, to put together a lot of uh, information about chemical alternatives assessment. And it's another hugely valuable tool. And this page, page in particular makes it really easy to go plug in your CAS number for a chemical, say um, I think this one is for formaldehyde, and then you can't quite see the list below, but the list, um, you, you plug in that CAS number for the chemical, and then uh, the, the list will be checked for all the databases that contain data about that chemical. So it's kind of a one-stop shop to start getting your uh, toxicity and environmental data. Next slide, please. So then our final real content section of the hub is, is, is some examples in, in a case study section. 
which I've divided by individual company efforts and then specific chemicals or compounds or products, and then studies conducted under the EPA Design for Environment Program. So the individual company efforts, I've just listed a couple of examples real quick. The Soil Cabinet Shop does, compares several different coating products, finds the, the best alternative, and ends up reducing their hazardous air pollutants. And um, this particular company in particular had was pushing up against their Title V permit and the new product that they identified and tested and found um, is allowing them to now increase production by another 70 percent and still remain under their under that uh, threshold. And then another kind of category is where a set of stakeholders is actually working together to find to assess the viability of a, of a specific compound or an, find a safer alternative to a specific compound in a particular product. Examples are the state of Maine who is assessing, or it did assess the viability of alternatives to uh, DECA, BD, fire retardant, and plastic shipping pallets. And then um, Turi and partners have evaluated, have done probably several of these, but including the one that Pam will talk about today, but I'll evaluate alternatives to satellite that's plasticizers in the wiring cable uh, coating industries. And then the third section of this uh, examples in the case study section are, are just brief synopsis of the, the, uh, the, the um, studies that the Design for Environment program has conducted, including the EPA alternatives and thermal paper receipts and chemical flame retardants in furniture and printed circuit boards. Next slide, please. So our final sections are just kind of resources, where to go for help, who are the organizations and experts in this area, who's, who's latest and greatest state-of-the-art information and, and can provide assistance. And so there's a regional and a national. Uh, you can click regional and see if there's area, folks in your area who might be able to provide support. And you can click, uh, click national, who's working on it nationally. And then our final final page is just links. Um, there's a lot of them. And uh, most of what I've discussed today is are, are included in this link page. So um, hopefully this will be a useful tool and resource for those who are starting off in the world of chemical alternatives assessment or even um, been working in it for a while. Uh, we hope to uh, that it was a um, it's going to be a useful tool, and we hope to add some sections as we have the time and funding to make it even more useful. So that's it. Next final slide is a thank you for attending. And please feel free to contact me. And also, I guess I should probably say that our this topic hub can be found at the URL in blue here, pprc.org slash hubs, H-U-B-S. And that's it for me. Thanks. And so, okay, uh, hi, um, this is Pam Eliasson. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Pam. Oh, I'll then. Okay. So, thanks, Cindy. And thanks, Michelle, um, for a really good presentation around some of the resources that the PPRC has put together. It's really interesting and you know I do encourage people to go and, and really play around with that topic hub. There's a lot to be found in there. I'm going to talk about some of the tools that we've used, but I'm going to put it into the context of a, uh, uh, some work that, that the Toxic Seas Reduction Institute has just recently um, updated. And that uh, specifically relates to assessing alternatives for uh, professional garment care industry. Um, so next slide, please. Just a, a little bit of a background around the work that we've done in Massachusetts around alternatives assessment. And you can see I used this little shorthand AA. Um, the Massachusetts legislature created an act in 1991, the Toxic Seas Reduction Act. And that requires companies who use toxic chemicals over a threshold amount to report on their use, but to also do, 
to do a biannual, every other year, planning effort. And the Toxics Use Reduction Planning has always incorporated the elements of what we now refer to as alternatives assessment. So specifically, um, companies that are using toxic chemicals need to look at why they're using those chemicals, identify what options there may be to the use of those chemicals. And those options, um, as Michelle said, could be uh, substituting for different chemicals. It could also be looking at different materials or processes, process upgrades, et cetera. And, and the planning process in Massachusetts, once you've identified those options, you evaluate which ones are technically and economically feasible. In Massachusetts, you're not required to implement any of the changes, but what we have found is that simply by going through the process of looking at what they're using and why and identifying whether or not there are alternatives, um, the companies have been able to achieve really in pretty significant uh, reductions in their use of toxic chemicals. In 2005, as, as um, Cindy mentioned, the Massachusetts legislature requested that the Institute do a study of five different chemicals, and that was really the inauguration of the term alternatives assessment, um, where we were assessing five chemicals, looking at at least three uses for each of the five chemicals and then trying to identify whether or not there are safer alternatives. And we found that indeed there are. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about one of those uses in particular. Again, that's the dry cleaning. But let me just kind of wrap up a little bit more about what we've done. Um, in 2008, we invited uh, people from across the country to join us in, in holding a conversation around how can states work together to promote um, the use of safer alternatives. And out of that came the, the idea of the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse. Um, so Turi's been really deeply involved in developing and maintaining um, what we've called this IC2 Safer Alternatives Wiki. It's not the database that Michelle showed you. It's something different. And I'll show you a screenshot of a piece of that later. But here's a web, um, the web address for that wiki. And the idea of the wiki is to build out the guidance around um, how to do an alternative assessment in accordance with the agreed upon methodology from that 2008 meeting. Um, and so I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. We continue to update um, our five chemicals study as those chemicals get designated as higher hazardous substances. Um, and so, so Turi continues to update and do new alternative assessments. And we also engage in national and international conversations about how to use um, this process as a way to promote a safer chemical economy. And we've done quite a few trainings. We just wrapped up a training um, just last week um, for, for companies you know, looking at using alternative assessment to promote safer chemicals. OK, so next slide, thanks. This is a graphic that comes from the IC2 wiki. So if you go to that web address that I showed you before, you can, on the very home page, you'll see this graphic. And what we've done is, what we're looking at here is um, with some additional language attached to the graphic itself to identify how companies engage in the different steps of an alternative assessment and, and then also how uh, TURI or other state agencies may be um, promoting and assisting companies. So the, the steps of an alternative assessment are to define the goal. What are, what are your goals in, in Massachusetts? That's really to reduce your use of toxics and to enhance your competitiveness in a global market. Um, once you know what you're doing, you, you need to look at whether or not there, you have chemicals of specific concern. And for companies, that's usually a strategic business business decision often um, promoted by customer demands. Prioritizing which uses um, you want to focus on for further evaluation. Truly, this is more of an issue for an agency that may be wanting to do policy. For companies, typically, they know what, what uses they, they are focusing on. Um, then once you've done that, you can identify and prioritize your alternatives um, and compare them and then make a choice. Uh, in, in Massachusetts, the Toxic Cease Reduction Institute really works on promoting the adoption of safer alternatives, and we do that in a number of different ways, as highlighted here. Um, 
at the, on the home page of the IC2 Safer Alternatives Wiki, um, you can find this graphic and you can actually scroll around the graphic and link to guidance for each of these different um, points of, of the process. And then you also see that there is a, a gear that says resources. And I'm going to show you a screenshot from the first page of the resources later. Um, but that's where you can access a whole lot of um, really powerful resources to assist you in the process of assessing safer alternatives. Okay, next slide. So what we do in Massachusetts is we try to achieve some balance between really diving deeply into the scientific protocol and, and, and the weeds of, of evaluating scientific studies with a, a more pragmatic approach. We focus on key criteria and, and it's really important to remember that in assessing alternatives, um, it's not just about your environmental health and safety impacts, that those inherent hazards that may be associated with a chemical of concern, but also and very significantly, it's about making sure that the options that you are looking at are indeed technically and economically feasible. If we want to see companies adopting safer alternatives, uh, you know, we need to make sure that those alternatives will give them the, the performance um, that they need without breaking the bank. So in Massachusetts, we um, do alternatives assessments. When we, we do this in collaboration with our, our stakeholders, and so we conduct site visits with users of alternatives. We review scientific information and information that may be derived from manufacturers. And then we do a number of different activities to try to promote the adoption of safer alternatives. So I'm going to walk through um, our recent update of the perchloroethylene study um, just to kind of show you how it's done. So next slide, please. So perk is a widely used chemical. It's really very versatile, but unfortunately it's also kind of an issue. We'll talk about that. But you know that um, perk has been used historically in a number of different ways um, for cleaning and degreasing and, of course, also in garment dry cleaning. So next slide. The concerns associated with PERC are, are many, um, and they continue to uh, it continues to be scrutinized by agencies um, because of the many chronic and, and acute um, concerns and hazards associated with it. Next slide, please. So when we're doing a toxic use reduction planning or when we're doing an alternatives assessment, we're really doing that um, for our audience, which are the practitioners, those planners in Massachusetts. And in this case, we're also really focusing on the small business owners, these shop owners for dry cleaners. They are facing increasing pressure to switch away from PERC. They have lease you know, they have um, landlords who are, are demanding that they no longer use PERC because of historic um, concerns with spills that have happened. Um, but recently, well, in 2008, PERC was also designated as a higher hazard stuff substance in Massachusetts, which means that now, uh, rather than having a 10,000 pound per year use threshold, if a company uses more than 1,000 pounds per year, they need to report and do planning. And so there's just more scrutiny on the use of PERC. Next slide, please. And the cleaners are trying to avoid that. They really are typically very small operations, and they don't want to have more regulations put on them. So what we wanted to do was to provide some additional guidance to help them find safer alternatives to, so that they would not need to be using a chemical for which they have you know, pretty significant regulatory obligations. We have studied seven different alternatives, as you see here, and have put together a report, which actually is being finalized and put on our website, hopefully by the end of this week. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about the different um, alternatives only briefly. What I'm going to do is, is do this by showing you kind of the summary um, tables that we have. Again, um, the, our approach at the Toxic Seas Reduction Institute is to be very pragmatic, and one of the ways that we do that is by focusing in on the key criteria that are decision points for a user, for somebody who's using a chemical of concern. So in dry cleaning, there are key criteria in, in technical and economic feasibility issues, 
um, for the technical and performance, clearly they, the performance is they need to have um, you know, their garments cleaned satisfactorily for their customers. But from, a, from an operational standpoint, the shop owners really need to know that they can maintain their efficiency um, by, by not significantly impacting the cycle time of the wash or their load capacity. They also need to know whether there are materials that, they, that may no longer be able to be treated if they switch to a different alternative. And they need to know if there are additional pre and post treatment requirements. Um, and then, of course, from an economic standpoint, there's just the capital costs and the energy costs associated with making a switch and how does that affect it. So in the next slide, we'll see um, a the summary of the data um, for the technical and the financial criteria. Now on the top you see the seven different alternatives to PERC, which is the reference kind of chemical that we're looking at. And you can see that, that we have different colors associated with them, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, what you'll see here on the left-hand side are the key um, technical and financial criteria that were identified, and then data or narrative about each of the different alternatives. So this is, our, this is the way that we've chosen to um, present uh, in a short form all of the information that we've pulled together in a much broader um, alternatives assessment process. Next slide, please. So um, are, they, are the alternatives that we looked at effective and affordable? Well, in fact, yes, they are all technically effective. You know, feasible. Um, there, there are differences in throughput through the facility that may be concerned, and there are some limitations on fabrics, but they all are able to be used as alternatives for dry cleaning using PERC. Most of them are indeed also quite affordable. I mean, the, the real exception to that is the carbon dioxide based options, and at least in Massachusetts, the shops um, do not consider that to be an economically feasible option, though they are being used in other parts of the country. Next slide, please. Environmental health and safety criteria of, of particular concern uh, include you know, whether or not um, the alternative is a PBT, uh, whether there are exposure limits that, that may affect the possibility of using it in the work environment, whether there are specific um, central nervous system effects, which are, are, are of a particular concern using PERC, whether um, the alternatives have any carcinogenic reproductive or developmental toxic effects, and then also the flashpoint, which it gives you an indication of whether there may be safety issues in the shop itself. Next slide. So here's the assessment um, for environmental health and safety um, considerations. And, and you can see, again, um, it's more of a narrative than, than actual data. And, and so it's presented in a way that hopefully can be used to help guide some decision making. We have actually ranked the alternatives based purely on the EHNS um, characteristics of the different alternatives. And so you can see that in our assessment, we, we clearly feel that wet cleaning is the preferred option. Carbon dioxide is also really a good option from an EHNS standpoint, but as I said, it's, it's really not all that affordable. Um, and then here's a number of other options, high flashpoint hydrocarbons, uh, acetals, which is a new product on the market, uh, propylene glycol ether based um, solutions, siloxane based cleaning solutions, and then finally n bromide, which um, Michelle mentioned. Next slide, please. There's also, we also look at, um, you know, applicable regulations and, and so whether or not alternatives might be hazardous air pollutants or VFCs. There's some regulations specific to Massachusetts. Remember I mentioned that PERC is a higher hazard substance, so also wanted to look and see if there are any other Massachusetts or state regulations that might be affected or any regulations or use of the alternative that might affect your hazardous waste disposal options or your wastewater discharge options. Next slide, please. 
So are the alternatives safer than PERC? Well, you know, really, yes, they are. Certainly, they are all less persistent. The hydrocarbon and siloxane options are more bioaccumulative and toxic in an aquatic environment, but all of the options are less persistent than PERC. Most of the alternatives are, in fact, safer to humans, with one very notable exception, and that, again, is the NPV, the N-propyl bromide, which is not only carcinogenic, but also a reproductive toxic and a neurotoxic. It is not a safer alternative, and we try to make that very clear. One of the reasons we try to make that very, very clear is that it actually is a very easy switch from an operational standpoint. It essentially can be used as a drop-in substitute to PERC, and so we've tried very hard to make that clear that that's not acceptable. There are data gaps associated with some of the alternatives, and, and that's a concern. Um, and so there's also some safety issues that need to be paid attention to, as well as some regulatory issues that may need to be paid attention to when you're making a choice. Next slide, please. So our bottom line is, again, we've decided that wet cleaning is the safest alternative to park dry cleaning at this point in time. And so we do what we can here in Massachusetts to promote the use of dedicated wet cleaning, including providing trainings and demonstrations of that and providing some matching grants to promote a switch to dedicated wet cleaning. Next slide. Um, you can find out more resources about dry cleaning at this website at Turi.org. Um, but I just want to get back into this more general um, idea. So when you see that as Turi goes through our alternatives assessment, we, um, we use a lot of resources to identify appropriate data to be able to make an assessment. And so some of those resources you can connect to through the ic2saferalternatives.org wiki. It's called a wiki because it's an invitation for people to contribute to it. And you'll see on the resources page we have um, a, a page for tools for assessing alternatives. We have a number of chemical databases identified, data sources for chemicals of concern, data sources for chemicals used in products, data sources for exposure. Um, it's a fairly good um, resource. Um, there's also examples that are provided of, all, of assessments that have been done. And there's also a link to um, identification of legislation that is currently being proposed or has been implemented that requires the use of alternatives assessment. So uh, similar to what Michelle was presenting with her topic hub, this IC2 Safer Alternatives Wiki um, really is intended to have this resource page that provides a really quick portal to different resources. Next slide, please. I did want to just briefly mention um, the P2 Oasis that Michelle mentioned. It's something that was developed at Turing years ago. It is a very data intensive process, but what it allows you to do is to look not only at the environmental health and safety characteristics of a, of a chemical and the alternatives, but to also consider um, worker implications associated with potentially making a switch. Um, it, it uses both quantitative and qualitative factors throughout the production phase of a product, and it relies on expert judgment to determine how certain you may be in the data that you're using. Um, okay, next slide. The laboratory at the Toxic Seas Reduction Institute uses the P2 Oasis to provide some guidance on whether or not chemicals are indeed safer. They do um, a lot of work in performance testing safer alternatives, and this website, cleanersolutions.org, is your portal to all of the information on the different chemicals that may be used and whether or not they um, can be considered as an alternative for a specific substrate and a specific contaminant. There's a lot of really great information there, and Jason Marshall, who is the lab director, is just a wonderful resource that I encourage people to take advantage of if you're looking for alternatives to cleaning applications. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm, that was interesting. So um, here's, here's a couple of, uh, you know, 
resources that, you know, you're welcome to contact me if you have any information, if you would like more information on the work that we do at Turi in alternatives assessment. Joy Onesh is our program uh, manager for the community and small business program, and she knows everything there is to know about dry cleaning and wet cleaning. And again, Jason Marshall from Turi's lab um, is just a terrific resource on the work that they do in performance testing safer alternatives. Um, so there, thank you very much. All right, thank you. We have a few questions that have come in already. Um, someone has requested Stephen Gilbert's paper on precautionary criteria assessment. Um, yes. Michelle, what's the easiest way? The easiest way is just to email me. Uh, if, if you can access these slides, uh, Angela's going to post them online somewhere and um, access them in my email as at the, on the final slide. And also, I saw a question about the, um, the, uh, di the assessment diagram that I, I flashed up. And, and funny enough, I cannot find out anywhere. Nobody will take credit for developing this, but it was used by Department of Ecology in one of their presentations. So I scoured and asked all these people who, who did this. Nobody, can, nobody will fess up to have cre having created it. So I guess it's free for people to use. And um, yeah, just, that's also just email me and I can send you a copy. Great, thank you. Uh, Pam, uh, the questions come up that the matrix of alternatives, um, the color coding looks very similar to green screen. Uh, mm -hmm. Are they compatible? Can you comment on that? I'm happy to comment on it. Yeah, sure, they're similar color schemes. They, and, and really that's just because I think globally we all recognize green is good and red is bad. And that's really what that is. Green screen is a wonderful tool for helping guide decisions. And it has a very specific process that Michelle kind of touched on for um, really trying to drill down and evaluate whether or not an alternative is incrementally better than the chemical of concern. Um, and so yes, they use a similar color scheme. No, it wasn't intended to um, indicate, uh, you know, whether one was a, a benchmark for green chemical versus a benchmark one red chemical. Um, but, but they do kind of reflect the same assessment. Um, but green screen has a very specific process that guides you towards benchmarking a chemical. Um, and, it, and that's actually an extremely valuable part of the green screen. It's really where the value add for that tool is. I, I would also just intervene real quickly. One thing I forgot to mention is with respect to green screen is that anybody can use the green screen methodology and tool, but you can But it's it's uh, it's only available for certifiable, verifiable results if you have had one of three different organizations across the country that are approved to conduct that full-on green screen. It is it's it's very data intensive and uh, very rigorous. So, but it, but it, but the tool is also very useful for internal use to get some kind of baseline and initial decision-making um, points. Angela, are there other questions? Sorry, I, was on, I put myself on mute. Um, has a full life cycle assessment been done comparing the various dry cleaning alternatives? A full life cycle assessment, no, and 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 this is not a life cycle assessment that we did. It's it's um, again, as I said, we we tried to be more pragmatic. So we identified key uh, criteria that would make a difference in helping an, uh, a shop make make a decision. So when we do think about life cycle uh, implications of a of a choice. Um, they're from a very pragmatic approach. So, for instance, it does include uh, evaluation of what the difference in 
cost would be for energy. And, and, and cost is a, is a fairly good indicator of use of energy. Um, but no, it's not a life cycle approach. Life cycle analysis is, can be an extraordinarily uh, intense and, and long process that um, I guess our feeling is for in particular small facilities like a, a dry cleaning shop, there's not a lot of value in going through that kind of a process. So we didn't do that either. No, it's not life cycle. It's really just focusing on the safety and the technical and economic feasibility of the options. Great. Um, one, another question, one more question, is the IC2 available to both state and industry? So the IC2 was developed for states who were trying to work together to harmonize their approach towards using alternatives assessment in policy. The IC2 wiki is available. Uh, for anybody to review and anybody who's interested in participating and building it out further is welcome to and they just need to apply uh, to be a writer and I actually am um, one of the people who reviews who wants to be, participate in that. Um, because it was developed for industry, um, excuse me, for states for their kind of policy and technical assistance approaches, um, we try to be careful around, you know, who is a writer. But frankly, I would love to have more people uh, apply to be writers for that, for that wiki. And and I would encourage anybody to certainly go and look at the wiki and use it. Um, but to apply to be a writer as well, I'd be happy to entertain that. Great. And one last question: How many dry cleaners are already using the safer alternative? And how are the results of the safe alternative assessment to be promoted to dry cleaning operations? So in Massachusetts, um, it's been it's been a process over a couple of years where we have ever since the 2005-2006 alternative assessment study that we did for Five Chemicals, we identified at that point wet cleaning as the preferred alternative, and we started promoting uh, the switch to um, wet cleaning by providing small seed grants to help these small shops make that switch. We have eight or nine um, cleaners in Massachusetts now that are dedicated wet cleaners. They're not just doing wet cleaning in addition to other kinds of dry cleaning. They're only doing wet cleaning. Um, and that's what we focus our small, you know, available funding on. And we have a number of uh, resources available. In California, they've been promoting the use of wet cleaning even longer, and um, they have much stronger regulations around that. And so there's many more uh, cleaners in California that are doing wet cleaning. Many of the companies are switching from PERC to some of the other alternatives. The, um, the acetals that I mentioned, which is a relatively new product, um, is being looked at uh, quite favorably by the cleaners. They see it as a relatively easy switch. At least that's what we're hearing from the manufacturer of the, of the alternative itself. Um, there's a lot of data data gaps associated with the chemical. There's also gaps associated with the performance and economic viability of it. And so um, we're keeping our eyes on that. I know that um, state of uh, excuse me, New York has also done a lot of work in this area and has been doing a lot of promotion to um, get companies to switch to safer alternatives. And they also have resources available. Any final questions, Angela? Uh, that was it. Okay, great. I would like to thank uh, Michelle and Pam for that great uh, series of presentations on chemical screening and alternatives assessment resources and databases. I thought that was really excellent. And you have a lot of resources that you can go to. And we'll be sure to post these on the NPPR website for you. So uh, thanks to Pam and Michelle and the attendees for this webinar. And I want to remind folks to complete the survey that will come to you after uh, this webinar is over. And you can see now on the screen is the upcoming event slide. So just a reminder about the MVP2 awards, or if you tuned in a little bit late, 
uh, application deadline of July 1st, our P2 week activities, uh, and the P2, a P2 toolkit, by the way, will be available July 1st, uh, and the, that will be four activities during P2 week, which is September 17th through 21st. Our fall webinar series will kick off again in September, and we'll be sure to get that information out to you. A green chemistry conference is going to uh, be held in Chicago in mid-November, along with a green screen also in Chicago at the Hyatt. So uh, we'll be sure to be getting that information out to you if you haven't already received the Save the Date notice on that. Uh, take, take a look at our website at p2.org slash challenge and consider joining the Safer Chemistry Challenge program, uh, helping to make all these resources available to you. And contact us with any questions you may have at saferchemistry at gmail.com. Uh, and again, thanks for joining us. And have a good summer.